Today, I hope you are rejoicing in the Lord. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to take a look at a parable similitude today in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. You can also find this similitude in Luke chapter 13 and verse 24. But today we're going to just study and concentrate in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 13, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This parable similitude emphasizes the divine truth that there are really only two ways in life. Right and wrong, good and evil, the way to heaven and the way to hell, saints and sinners, godly and ungodly. Now let me ask you this question. Which way are you going? On what road are you traveling? You see, folks, Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. He's the only way. Now, let's take a look at this parable, similitude, and kind of dissect it, break it down, and see exactly what the Lord is speaking here. First, I want you to see the command. The command. Notice the directive. Enter ye in at the straight gate. Now, Christ gave a command to walk on the right way. For the straight gate is the gate that opens to the right way. This directive to go the right way, has it, it tells us some important things about God. Uh, it, de it declares God's character, for example. God's commands never counsel us to sin. They never lead us astray. Why? Well, because God is a holy God and a righteous God. Therefore, God's commands are holy and God's commands are righteous. So it not only declares God's character, but it discloses God's concern. God's commands always have our best interests at heart. They're always profitable for us to follow. God's commands are intended, listen to me, to bless us, not to burden us. So there's this directive. But I also want you to see in verse 13 this, this difficulty. Not surprisingly, this command of God about going the right way is a difficult command to do. And this is seen in two words. One of the words you can find in Luke chapter 13 and verse 24, it's the parallel passage. Jesus says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Now that word strive, uh, we get our, our, comes from a Greek word that we get our word agony from. I think that's interesting. The same word is translated in... Um, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12 is laboring fervently. So when Jesus says in Luke 13, 24, strive to enter in at the straight gate. See, entering the right way and doing the right thing is obviously not easy to do. It requires effort. Now, this isn't the teaching of salvation by human effort or human works. But it is teaching that you have to earnestly want to be saved in order to come to Christ. There must be a heart's desire to come to Christ. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. So it's difficult that you have to strive. Also, notice the word straight. 
Christ commanded us, enter ye in at the straight gate. Now notice the spelling of the word straight there. In my Bible, it's spelled S-T-R-A-I-T. Don't confuse the word straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, with straight like a straight line, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, okay? The word used here, straight, means narrow. For example, the Strait of Gibraltar is a narrow waterway that connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Atlantic Ocean. So the word straight means narrow. It means difficult. It means uh, affording little room. You see, the right way is the difficult way because the gate to the right way is narrow and it's restrictive. In Luke 13, 24, Christ emphasized this truth when he said, many, listen, many will seek to enter in and shall not be able. The narrowness of the gate speaks of the narrowness of the way of salvation. Salvation is restricted to those who come through Jesus Christ. There is only one way of salvation, not many ways of salvation. We see this truth in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given whereby men must be saved. It's the name of Jesus Christ. Listen, it's, it's very difficult for many people to accept the fact that Christ is the only way of salvation. Sinful man prefers works, but faith in Christ is the only way. So that's the command. Now I want you to notice the contrasts. The contrasts. In this parable about the two ways of life, Christ describes the character of each way. The character of the two ways is a study in contrasts, because the two ways are totally opposite in character. The wrong way and the right way are as different in character as night and day. Let's take a look at them. First, the wrong way. Verse 13. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Now, the character of the wrong way can be described in three words. One, easy. The wrong way is easy. Why? Because the gate's wide. There's no restrictions. Anyone can enter the wrong way. It's easy to travel uh, to the wrong way because the way is broad. I mean, you can be a staggering drunk and still find your way because it's the broad way. Notice the second word, deceitful. The word translated broad in verse 13 means spacious, suggesting a magnificence in appearance as well as in size and width. You see, folks, sin is splashy. It's impressive. It's attractive. This makes sin deceitful because its consequences are always tragic. The wrong way is easy. It's deceitful. And it's popular. Look at verse 13. Many there be which go in thereat. This is the way where you'll always find a crowd. This will be the way that will be most recommended to you. I mean, sin is popular. That's why sin captures so many people. When I was a young guy, I, I would uh, tell my dad, Dad, everyone is doing it. Well, when everyone is doing it, you tend to think that it's the right thing to do. But being popular is not a substitute 
for being pious. Let me say that again. Being popular is not a substitute for being pious. Just because you're popular with your friends does not mean that you're popular with God. So there's the wrong way. It's easy, it's deceitful, and it's popular. Then there's the right way in verse 14. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Christ gives two main features of the wrong way. First, it's difficult. The word narrow in verse 14 means to be hardened in, like a, like a, a mountain gorge pressed together. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the, the same word is used, it, it, it's the same Greek word is translated troubled or afflicted or suffer tribulation. Listen, the right way is the difficult way. Christ never said it was easy to be a Christian. In fact, after you've gotten on the right way, it becomes, it continues to be difficult. So the right way is difficult. And number two, it's unpopular. Look at verse 14. Few there be that find it. Here is a very difficult divine truth. Few people will be saved. Few people will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Few people will enter in to eternal life. Most people think that you can live your life in total neglect of God, and in the end, God will extend to you His mercy. See, folks, true salvation is unpopular. And being unpopular only adds to the difficulty of the way. You see, repentance and faith in Christ and holiness in life have never been fashionable. Many of you have heard of Jerry Falwell. Years ago, Jerry Falwell was the founder of what he called the moral majority. That sounds nice, but it's a myth. The majority has never been moral. Just the thought of a moral majority really contradicts Scripture. Few find the right way. So there's the wrong way. It's easy, it's deceitful, it's popular. Then there's the right way. It's difficult and it's unpopular. Now there's the conclusion. I grew up in a small little town in upstate New York called Rome, New York. And right outside of Rome, New York, it's located in the Mohawk Valley. Just outside the city limits was a lake. It's called Lake Delta. It's a 3,000 acre lake which was created when the state of New York built a dam in 1912 and essentially flooded the area and destroyed the little village of Delta. And on Lake Delta there's an area called the Palisades. The Palisades are a 30-foot high shale cliff. And Kenny and David Sullivan and Paul Mosier and I would hitchhike to the Palisades. You're just, just teenagers. Without our parents' knowledge, and we would climb up the Palisades, and we would jump off the Palisades into Lake Delta to swim. Now, the Palisades were these shale cliffs and they entered the water in at an angle. So to clear the rocks at the bottom you had to run real fast and jump out as far as you could so that you wouldn't hit the cliff on the way down. Boy, I, my, my mom and dad ever found out I did that. I, I, I'd probably still be in trouble if my mom ever found out about it even today. But anyway, I can remember standing there as a teenage boy, getting ready to run and jump off the Palisades, and with my heart racing as I got ready to run and jump. 
And I would focus on the exciting initial experience of jumping off that cliff. And I never for one minute gave a thought of what might happen if, at the conclusion of that jump if I didn't jump far enough. Looking back, it was a very foolish thing for me to do. The jump itself was something that was really only going to be temporary, but the conclusion had the potential of being permanent if I had hit those rocks. You see, folks, similarly, Satan wants us to focus on the here and now. He doesn't want you to focus on the hereafter. He wants us to focus on the temporary, not the eternal. He wants us to focus on the the initial f fun part of the jump, not the destructive end. Folks, if you don't look at the end, you'll be deceived into thinking the wrong way is the best way. I want you to notice in verse 13 the conclusion of the wrong way. The conclusion of the wrong way. Verse 13 says, The wrong way leadeth to destruction. Destruction is the conclusion of the wrong way. It's not the end of existence, but the end of comfort in existence. You don't cease to be, you cease to be well. It is not the loss of being, it's the loss of well-being. Now there are at least two things which are destroyed at the end of this wrong way. First, you lose your peace. You lose your peace. Isaiah 57 and verse 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Folks, this isn't a temporary loss of peace. It's an eternal loss of peace. Eternal loss of peace is the final conclusion of the wrong way. The wrong way is the way of disappointment. The further you go on this way, the less satisfaction there is. And the end is total dissatisfaction and destruction of peace. So the conclusion of the wrong way is you lose your peace. Then notice this, you lose your soul. You lose your soul. Mark chapter 8 and verse 36 says, For what shall it profit a man? if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. So, there's the conclusion of the wrong way. <laughs> but thankfully, the Bible also tells us the conclusion of the right way in verse 14. Verse 14 says, The right way leadeth unto life. The wrong way leads to loss, the right way leads to life. Two quick points. Abundant life. Abundant life. John 10.10 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they, they might have it more abundantly. Listen, folks. The right way is the abundant way, the plentiful way, the rich way. The absolute fullness of life belongs to those who belong to God. So you have the abundant life. And then notice eternal life. This life is eternal life. This life is everlasting life. This life continues forever. There is no end to it. No end to the joy, no end to the peace, no end to the blessing, no end to the bliss. The straight gate, the wide gate, the narrow way, the broad way. The way that leads to life, the way that leads to destruction. Two ways, one choice. Which choice have you made? May God bless you until we have our Bible study again.